We are live. It's Empire State of Baseball, episode number 44, on this Tuesday, May the 2nd, 2023, airing exclusively on Twitch, and powered by StreamYard. Gentlemen, gentlemen, no Tom. What's up, Corey Joe? How are we doing today on this Tuesday evening? Yeah, not bad. Hanging in there. Not in Italy. Still in New Jersey, yeah. uh, unlike our uh, fourth co-host today. But listen, uh, three's a company. Love having the three of you guys here. Well, the three of us here, I should say. Uh, and it should be a good show regardless of losing one of our uh, key co-hosts. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm. hey, listen, I'm great. My Devils won a Game 7 yesterday. Unfortunately, at the Rangers' Empire expense. Empire State of Hockey. Not oh. Empire State of Hockey. Let's not get it started. Uh, congrats to the Devils, though. They are a local team, and uh, we, we wish them nothing but the worst uh, against the Carolina Hurricanes. <laughs> um, all righty. Well, we're going to get into a show in a little bit. Uh, let's get through the lineup for episode number 44 of ESB on a Tuesday and welcome again on another Tuesday edition. We always appreciate you guys uh, jumping in when we're not supposed to be on this day. We're always on Mondays the last two weeks because of the big NHL games in the area. Uh, we went to Tuesdays, but we'll be back on the Monday schedule starting uh, next week. But our lineup for tonight, the Bronx is burning and it is certainly burning and we're going to get into it. Well, I'm definitely going to get into it in a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk on the Yankees and the Aaron Judgeless New York Yankees at that. Then we get into Chooch's pick of the week. We uh, hear from Matt, or at least uh, take in Matt's pick of the week to see what his game choice of the week is for Major League Baseball. We then got the Queen's Gambit. We're going to talk Mets Braves. And, of course, the rainouts. And we got to get into the talk of retractable roofs over baseball stadiums. It's Apro Pro once again that we got to get into it. So we will talk about it later on tonight. We got Guest the Graph. No Tom today. He's in Italy, but I will be hosting Guest the Graph in his steed. Uh, so we got a ball to uh, to get the player on later on tonight. And lastly, we're going to finish off with a new bit here on Empire State of Baseball called FSQ, also known as Fan Submitted Questions. We're going to take on your live questions either from the chat, from Instagram, from Twitter, from all over the place. So make sure to give us a follow on all our socials. Send us a question. Use that hashtag FSQ, and we're going to answer your questions later on tonight uh, towards the top of the hour, bottom of the hour, rather. But until then... Let's talk New York Yankees baseball. Why not? Baseball. And uh, gentlemen, it's been tough. It's been tough to be a New York Yankee fan. But before I, I really get into it here, I wanted to hear from you two first. In just a simple few words, Joe, how can you sum up Yankee baseball to Yankee fans over the last couple of weeks? Um, this is kind of a role reversal from what the Yankees have always been. I mean, the Yankees are now going to have to come from behind. They did the opposite last year. They went way out ahead. And, um, you know, in a few words, it's like, well, welcome to what everybody else feels. I mean, this is this is what teams go through. And the Yankees have been practically immune to this, uh, you know, in the last couple of decades for the most part. Um, you know, and this is a team that has, what, the third highest payroll in the sport. and it's not working at the moment. It, it, it's going to be tough sledding. It might, it might be a long season. And something to think about, you know, you can't win a pennant in April, but you can lose one. And the Yankees might have lost one in April already. Yeah, it, it's rough right now for the Yankees. And I know I do stress a lot of times that it's still early in the season. I try not to get too caught up in April uh, and I said it a few times, it's like you look at last year, for example, perfect example, Phillies were dreadful. They ended up firing Joe Girardi. They went to the World Series. Year before, Mets were right there leading the NL East. Braves were under 500 early in the first half of that season. Braves won the World Series, Mets missed the playoffs. Uh, but the one thing, if I was to describe the Yankees in one word right now, it's boring. And this is not the Yankees that we really know and love. Uh, and look at like their last 12 games. The last 12 games, they've scored over two runs once. Mm -hmm. Once in 12-plus games, they've scored more than two runs once. And that was back last Wednesday against the Twins, a 12-6 victory. Uh, other than that, they're getting shut out. One run, 
to run. And the starting pitching, it's not like the Mets of 2015, where the Mets seem to be getting a shutout or one run or two runs given up by the starting pitching every given night. The Yankees starting pitching, five, six, seven runs. And the one time they're getting a great outing last night with Herman, what happens? Boom, you took him out and you left it up to the bullpen. And Holmes right now, oh boy, he did his uh, uh, one of his worst Mariana Rivera impressions you could possibly do there. Uh, I mean, right now it, it's pretty bad for the Yankees. It's early, but it is not good right now. Bronx is burning, as we said before. Corey Favs did a you did a Mets minute last week and you just alluded to it before um, where you told New York baseball fans overall to relax. It's a long season. Mm -hmm. And I look at the calendar, at least I look at the date in the quarter of my screen. I see May 2nd and I think to myself, the optimistic side says, all right, it's a long season and the Yankees could possibly bounce back from it. But how can I relax after the last few weeks of Yankee baseball? The Yankees entered the season with a team that was already banged up. They lost three-fifths of their super rotation. They lost an elite glove in center field in Harrison Bader, who, obvi who is back today, which is cool to see. Uh, John Carl Stan, shortly thereafter the season start, on the IL, again. And then the trickle-down effect, Josh Donaldson goes on the IL. And I don't want to – obviously, Donaldson, not the most favorite Yankee. But let me tell you something. I'll take Josh Donaldson in the bottom third of the Yankees order over IKF Higashioka and Aaron Hicks, but you also lose that glove. Every move made or every loss has a trickle down effect. The Yankees are banged up and I can't blame what is, is unforeseen, but yes, last night, an example of what I can blame that's in your control. The Yankees are banged up. They had the most nightmarish road trip. You can imagine they lost the series to the Minnesota twins. Something they haven't done since May of 2001. 2001 lost a series to them. Judge goes into third sliding unnecessarily and awkwardly, gets injured. We lose him to the hip injury. Judge goes on the IL yesterday. And honestly, Judge should have gone on the IL from the very beginning because even with Judge in the lineup right now and him at less than 100%, the Yankees are nowhere to be found otherwise. They are a bad team with with or without Aaron Judge. It's rough to watch. So he gets hurt in the series. Rangers go off of them, score 15-2 to on Sunday. And, of course, last night's game where the Yankees had a complete game shutout in hand, Domingo Herman, two outs away. And, listen, I don't think any Yankee fan or analyst would have criticized Boone for leaving Herman in the game, and he gave up a two-run tying home run to Jose Ramirez. I don't think anybody would have gotten mad. You would have tipped your caps up. All right, they got us. Hopefully we can come back in the next inning. But no, they took that possibility out, putting the most unreliable relief pitcher on the mound to end that game. And of course, the rest is history. Yankees lose, Hicks with a bad strikeout. So things need to change. You cannot lose games because the manager made a bad decision with everything else going on in the Bronx right now. The Yankees can't afford it. The Yankees need Boone to step up as a manager, see what's the best moves with the pieces he has. And it's up to the organization to try to find guys, if possible, that can help ease the test. Listen, you're not going to replace Aaron Judge. You're not going to replace John Carlos Stan. But what the Yankees can do and a philosophy they followed over the last few years was something called next man up. They were able to find talent that was able to sustain the, the injuries and keep the Yankees above 500. Names like Gio Urshela, Mike Talkman, Cameron Mabin, uh, even DJ LeMay, who came in as just a utility player who was supposed to be a bench guy. Uh, Matt Carpenter last year. Jose Trevino. You kind of have to figure out a way to find somebody within the organization or out of the organization to help out. And that's where I'm trying to be optimistic, guys, about the rest of this year because it is a long year. You don't know who's going to emerge as a hero that's going to step up out of nowhere. That's what I'm banking on. But for now, this Yankee team sticks. Yeah, I, I think the biggest problem right now, it's not one person that's going to turn around and make the difference for the Yankees. Even when Judge was in the lineup, this team was struggling. And the problem is multiple facets of the team are terrible at the moment. There's just the, – the Yankees have a talent problem. This is not an injury pro – this is partially an injury problem. This is a pure talent problem. I mean, your outfield today is Cabrera – Harrison Bader and Aaron Hicks, 
That's not good enough. That's the worst outfield in the league at the and moment. It's better than last night's, which is even scarier. And, and and the problem is, even with Judge back, you don't have the bats. If Anthony Rizzo's your second best bat, I'm sorry, you're gonna lose. That's not good enough. DJ LeMay, okay. who listen, we know he's a good player, but he's old. He's not gonna be able to carry the offense like he did three, four years ago. Um the rotation is in shambles. Rodone is not coming back. I, if you see Rodone before the All-Star break, you consider yourself lucky. He's he's not coming he's not coming back before the All-Star break. He just It's had amazing. Back, right? the, the news the news just gets worse and worse. Yeah. It's like after yeah. last night's uh shit kicking, the Yankees lose Rodon for another, another number of uh weeks, yeah. maybe months. Lou, Lou Trevino, who was going to be a good portion of the Yankees bullpen, uh, out for the rest of the year with Tommy John surgery. Mm -hmm. They lose Jonathan Loisga out of nowhere. He might be out for the rest of the season. And it's, again, yeah. the injuries are going to happen. For them to happen at this rate is crazy. Uh, and, and it's but, unfortunate, but the talent around this team, and this is what Joe is alluding to, is poor. You can't mm -hmm. lead a team with the current core that they have. And if you're going to rely on somebody from AAA, like an Andres Traparo or an Elijah Dunn to come up and save the day, it's just not realistic. It's hopeful yeah. because we've seen next man up work, but it's not realistic. I'll give you some numbers, and Corey, I'm going to toss it to you. Yankees right now, from a team perspective, in terms of at batting average, they're 27th in baseball with a 226. The only three teams that are worse than them are the Tigers, the Kansas City Royals, and surprisingly, the Seattle Mariners. Outside of that, they are also 25th in OPS with a 672, which ain't great. Also, they are 22nd in run scored in the league. They average less than three runs a game. Yeah. That is not good. Yeah, especially being in Yankee Stadium, good. too. It, Cause it, yeah, because even the, the Yankees, when they don't have their best years, the one thing they seem to always have is the pop. Uh, so that OPS number in the bottom tier of the league is very surprising. Uh, but I want to bring back a point that Joe mentioned in one of our uh, season preview shows was with the Yankees and uh, top heavy team with Judge, with Stanton, with Cole. And, and Joe said himself, a couple of those guys go down and a couple of them, notoriously the ones, the two that are on the IL right now are injury prone guys. Uh, that team is going to be looking for help if those bo guys both go down. Well, they both went down. Uh, Stanton's obviously a lot further away than Judge. You hope Judge is only going to be the minimum, maybe two weeks on the IL. We'll see what happens. But that offense right now, you really do not have a single slugger in that lineup, which is unlike any Yankee team that I could remember in my 31 years. Uh, the Yankees always had a slugging team at minimum and at least gave you a shot every night with home runs. But there's not a single home run here, unless you're expecting yeah. Rizzo to be back in his 2015 form, Torres to have a monster year, DJ, and even when DJ's at his best, he's not a slugger. DJ at his best is a line drive hit, a hitter hitting doubles in the gap. And, he's not a guy who's out there in 30 home runs. And Corey, you know why Rizzo won't be that guy? Because now Rizzo is looked at as the threat of the Yankees order. He's going to get walked yeah. more. He's going to get pitched yeah. around more. There's not going to be an immediate threat now. At least Rizzo presented that next threat if Judge was put on. But the Yankees just don't have that right now. Correct. Listen, and, and the other thing is the problem, and, and I said it when Judge went down. Judge, by the way, has a hip injury. Those are tricky with when it comes to hitters, yeah. especially sluggers. True. Hips are very a very big part of, of – a guy like Judge's uh, 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 physique. So, um, you know, but the other part of it too is the bullpen struggling and you don't have an established arm. And the pro again, the issue with the Yankees is it's not one thing and there's no way to solve these issues, at least at this point in the season. You, If you don't tread water to the point where you can get yourself into wild card contention by the all-star break, you're not, you might be able to address one or two of these issues Maybe you get a veteran arm in the back end of the rotation that helps solidify those late innings, but you're not going to be that. This who's going to be out there? Araldis Chapman. We're going to go back down that road. I'll tell you as what, Chapman would be looking real concerned. good with this team right now, too. You, well, I can, I, there's that, no you can set me off on a whole other tangent here, Corey, because <laughs> looking at these players who've donned other uniforms after the pinstripes and seeing their success across baseball. I, I know we went with the old adage, and as New York Mets fans, you guys know it best, that 
if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. But if you can't, if you can't perform in New York, it's probably because you're playing for a New York team. I don't know if that's true anymore. I really think this is a reflection on the Yankees organization. I truly do. Because if it's not, it's just not one or two players. It is multiple players now that have, have come to the Yankees, were a success story, an all-star, a World Series champion and hero, came over to the Yankees, did none of that, went elsewhere, and continued their success before the Yankees. That is an organization issue. So I don't know what philosophy the Yankees are trying to push on their players, but clearly it hasn't worked for a lot of players who are coming in. And for yeah. some players who are within the organization have gotten better since leaving the Yankees, like a Tyro Estrada. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. And you talk about the organization issues too. And think of it this way. If they would have let Cashman go, I know his contract expired and – regardless of what happens here or the remainder of his contract, he's going to go down as probably the greatest GM in New York sports for the success he's had over the last several decades. But that would have been the perfect time to say, all right, you know what? It's time bringing a new regime. Let's start over. It's starting to get a little tired. And what happens? They give him a four year extension. Uh, a lot of fans. I know of uh, one of our uh, famous chooch, uh, with his picks of the week, he wanted Cashman out really bad, and he was very upset when he got that four-year extension, Cashman. Uh, you're locked into this now. Aaron Boone, too, the organization loves him. He's an organization guy. But the problem, to your point, Rich, the organization right now, it's a tired act. It, 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 it's hard to take yeah. that next step forward as an organization when you're still stuck in the past. Uh, and the question is, how do you turn the page, especially on a guy like Cashman, where he's going to be the greatest GM probably in baseball history? How do you as an organization turn that page? Uh, I, I don't know how they do it, but they had their out when the contract expired. They could have made a whole thing about it, but they uh, they and it's, it instead extended him. And now they're either going to be stuck with him or they're going to have to look bad firing him. Uh, or somehow they come to some sort of agreement. I don't know, but they had an out, and instead mm -hmm. they doubled down. Yeah, and and Cashman, listen, C Cashman would have a job in a second. I mean, yep. there's nobody that wouldn't hire him. But you get to a point where he's been there for nearly a quarter of a century. I think he's been there for exactly a quarter of a century. He, it, it, sometimes it's just it's time for a new voice. Whether that doesn't necessarily mean that Cashman over his tenure has done a bad job. It doesn't mean that the Yankees have underachieved in his regime. I mean, they've won five championships in 25 years. Yeah. You'll yeah. take anybody, any franchise in the world, except maybe the Patriots would take that. Um, you know, but at the, at a certain point in time, it gets to be, okay, we we're clearly not what we once were. Part of that is the league catching up on the other end of it. But at the same time, the, the depth and the talent at the fringes of the organization, they still have that top heavy mentality. And the difference between the 2000s and the late 90s is the depth was everywhere. Every player was good on the Yankees. Every guy coming off the bench could hit or steal a base. And, and, and you know, they had Tim Raines on, on coming off the bench at one point. Yeah. He was in the Hall of Fame. I mean, that's. That's the kind of Yankee team that we had. Now the Yankees are third in the league in payroll, and the guys coming off the bench are DFA'd by half the teams in baseball. You're telling look. me Willie Calhoun and Frenchie Cordero are your guys off the bench to replace Judge and 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 these? That's not good enough. That's not good enough. And the one thing with the Mets, and I give the Mets credit here, and the Mets don't have a great offensive team by any stretch of the imagination. But the first guys up for the Mets when Escobar failed are a top prospect. You know, Escobar is on your bench. Escobar can play a little bit, you know, and and the Dodgers, every single time somebody gets hurt, what do they do? They call up another guy and they slide right in and they play. And that is an organizational depth and organizational building philosophy that the Yankees have not had in a long time. They've been able to withstand injuries. And I will, I will slightly defend the organization because, as I mentioned, I mentioned the list of players before, uh, players that stepped into roles when players went down and still were able to sustain success. The 2019 Yankees were the makeup of the next man yeah. of philosophy. Mm -hmm. They ended up going 103-59. and 59. Aaron Boone finished in second place in the manager of the year voting that year. 
Cashman, some of the be better moves that year were the small moves that Cashman made, not the big splashes, not the big trades where you're sending most of your pitching capital for one player who's already hurt. Uh, the, the Some of the smart plays Cashman has made over the last few years are those small moves. And maybe he's already made them. Who knows? Cole Calhoun could come up and have a, a solid season, but you can't depend on that. You just can't depend on that philosophy nowadays. It just doesn't work, especially when most lineups nowadays consist of five, six core players that could potentially be all-stars. That's just how mm -hmm. baseball is. And the philosophies that the Yankees had in the late 90s and with a lot of the front office people that they have that are still employed to the team that were back on those, er those late 90s, early 2000s teams, guess what? Those philosophies aren't going to work in 2023. There should have been a change made last year. And I agree with Chooch. We mentioned Chooch before. I agree with him. Brian Cashman should have been out of a job. And he would have found once in, in 29 other teams of baseball would have given him some kind of role. It should not have been with the Yankees. They should have replaced him. The Yankees issues right now outside of injuries. There is an organizational philosophy that needs to stop. Yeah. And you could go right to the top too, right at ownership. Because the one good thing with the Yankees back in the George days where you knew if it was mediocrity or worse, there were going to be changes. And whether that was cleaning yeah. house and the coaching staff – in the front office, getting rid of players. You think Hicks would still be on this team in prime no. four years? And the no. other thing is even look at 2009. Uh, we could talk all we want about Cashman. 2009, he had the three biggest offseason signings with CC Sabathia, AJ Burnett, uh, Teixeira. And what happens? They win a World Series right off the rip, making those three big moves. You no longer trust the Yankees to be in that position because each year, look at the last few years, shortstop, prime example. And granted, you see, you think Volpe is the future. I, still, I have a lot of faith in Volpe. Fine. I believe it. But shortstop has been one of your weakest positions for the last five years. And the last couple of off seasons, you had premier top end shortstop town available. And the Yankees really weren't even in the conversation with the exception of a maybe a brief week where oh, they, they might get Correa really weren't mentioned at all as serious contenders. Now, next offseason, you're going to have Shohei Otani, the face of baseball. George would be planning his offer right now as we speak. The Yankees aren't even a rumored team. If he's coming no. to New York, it's going to be in Queens. Could you imagine yeah. that? It's like the Mets and the Yankees switched ownership groups here. The Mets are now the big spenders. And Steve, granted, he's not as big of a uh, – I'm trying to think of the word. He's not as uh, – I should think realize. Yeah, but Cohen right now, I, I think he's a calmer personality than George, but he's got that same, okay. I'm going to buy what I could do in order to win a championship. The, I think the big problem is not necessarily the Yankees aren't big spenders anymore because they got payroll of $289 million. In the the problem is that they're spent so poorly when you look at it. I mean, you look at the production you've gotten out of Stanton, uh, which is 30 something million dollars. I know the Marlins yep. are picking up some, as Tom says. But still on the books. Uh, Donaldson's twenty one million dollars. DJ's getting old. He's fifteen million. Luis Severino never pitches. He's fifteen. Aaron Hicks is ten. Montas is seven and a half. Kind of Fleff is six. I mean, you got a hundred million dollars wrapped up in players that aren't any good. And that should have got you. signed after that after a career year. Granted, Lemayhu in his prime was a good player, but he was not the type of player he was before he got that extension. And not for nothing. And let's not forget, let's not forget twenty six million dollars a year to a pitcher that hasn't barely thrown a pitch yet to start yeah. the year. So the, the Yankees uh, have and, the Yankees' problem is twenty twenty six. They have one hundred and fifty million dollars on the books, and that's Judge Cole, Stanton, Rodone, and DJ are all still going to be here. The core of your team is not good enough, and the core of your team is going to be that core for the next five years. That's the problem. And these are not movable contracts. No one is taking Stanton off your hands. Nobody's taking DJ LeMahieu off your hands, and you're not going to so Why would they? Why would any team bail the Yankees no, they out? Wouldn't. You know? yeah. Why would they bail them out? There's no need for these players, especially when they don't produce and they don't stay on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's rough, yeah. and, and I know we can get more into it, and I'm sure we will as the season progresses. This is only May 2nd. I'm sure by May – uh, eighth, we're gonna have something else to talk about, and I'm just gonna lose my my absolute head. But we're gonna we're gonna keep it moving, guys. Uh, great stuff though. Uh, but we're gonna get into Chucha's pick of the week in a little bit. Before we get there, Corey, best way uh, to view us on the live stream. 
Best way to view us on a live stream, download that Twitch app right on your phone and subscribe to Empire State of Baseball right on Twitch. If you're looking for the link, go to our link tree. Our link tree can be found in both our Twitter and Instagram profiles. That link tree will provide you the links to everywhere, not only Twitch, which is the best way to watch us live, but you'll find our YouTube link in there and all of our other links within that link tree. So go ahead, download Twitch, subscribe, Empire State of Baseball. You will get a notification every time we go live, which is typically every Monday, if not Tuesday. And we do have the occasional ad hoc show, especially in the winter when we do our uh, little off-season uh, mm -hmm. spur-of-the-moment move. So download that Twitch app so you get that notification. Yes, sir. Uh, for now, though, we're going to get into Chooch's pick of the week. And uh, poor Chooch, he's 0-2 to start the campaign. Oh, and uh, not not good numbers for Matt, who, who did well last season. But uh, Matt's Chooch's pick of the week. And unfortunately, we, we don't have the audio up here. We've been having some audio issues with, uh, with, with, with some of these videos. So we are just going to announce the pick here on ESB. Uh, Matt's going to go Pirates, Tampa Bay Rays. And why wouldn't he? They are the two best teams in their respective leagues, and surprisingly, uh, I mean, even surprisingly for even Tampa would've, Bay, would've where teams lost, looked at Tampa Bay as a third place team, but for the Pirates, the Pittsburgh Ooh, Pirates are a first place team in baseball. Well, he's got Pirates Rays. Uh, they're going to be in Tampa Bay, and he has the Tampa Bay Rays winning the series. Uh, so I, I don't know if it was two games to one or three. Oh, I have to check back on the video, which you can check out, by the way. On Instagram at Empire State of Baseball, check out our story. That's where Matt makes his pick, and also you can vote on if you believe Matt is right and how right is he. You believe in a sweep for the Tampa, for Pittsburgh, a win series? Uh, we want to hear from you on Instagram. But what do you guys think? Uh, Pirates raised Joe. Yeah, uh, Pirates have been the surprise team right now. The Rays are leading three one, so that kind of helps uh, with the decision making. But I, I, I think the Pirates um, have been off to a fantastic start. They've had unbelievable pitching. Uh, everybody's basically been uh, consistent around the th mid three ERA. Uh, they've gotten so the most out of McCutcheon to start the year and a couple of other uh, players. They just locked up Reynolds long term. So the Pirates got a little momentum going. I don't know if they sustain this, but this is a building block for them to for future seasons. But I can kind of see them leveling off at some point. Listen, the Rays are the Rays are pistol hot. I mean, I can't. I can't see the Rays dropping two out of three in this series, so I'm going to get the Rays. I'll give the Pirates one game, um, but the Rays have off to an unbelievable start. They they might run away with the division and hide um, if they this keeps so much longer. Yeah, I'm going to roll here, too, with Joe and the Chooch. I'm going to give the Rays the advantage here, 2-1 in the series. And I just want to take a step back here for a moment. I mean, I said before, I try not to put too much stock in April. And this is a perfect example. I mean, the Pirates are not going to be the best team in the National League. The Rays, I mean, they're as hot as they are. Are they going to be the best in the American League? Eh, you never know. I'm a little more confident in the Rays and the Pirates. The Pirates are aren't even going to win that division, let alone be the best in the league. But as a Pirates fan, though, you'll have to be really pumped because about time your team spends a little money, you extend Reynolds. I know we talked about a little bit about that. Uh, talked a little bit about it last week, so good for you. Uh, enjoy the ride while it lasts. I hope your team makes the playoffs because that would be a great story for the game of baseball. But this is why I try not to get too invested in April. In April, there's a lot of flukes. You can't judge a team by April. By Memorial Day, you have an idea of where your team's going. So uh, good for the Pirates right now, but I'm going to take the Rays 2-1 in this series, and the Pirates will not win that division this year. Even the goddamn stupid Pittsburgh Pirates are better than the New York Yankees so far this year. The same Pirates that I was crapping on last year, had the back and forth with all the Pirates fans on social media, and here they are. The Pirates are the best team in the National League. Uh, so I'm going to continue my hatred of Pittsburgh Pirates fans, and I am going to go raise with the sweep. Uh, not the rats here, core. What the? Uh, but we got 3 0 over the Pirates. Uh, Rays are simply going to be a better team. And to Core's point here, Pirates got to come down to earth eventually. And I think this is going to be the starting point here. Tampa has just been clicking on all cylinders. And you know, the thing with Tampa Bay, uh, they've always had this knack for the last few years where they can lose talent like that and replace them with even. Just as good talent like that. They are that damn good. And not only that, they replace talent 
And when that talent goes elsewhere, it's not like the reverse Yankee effect. Correct. Those guys are normally terrible with the teams they end up going to after their, their Rays run is over with. So they're incredible. Tampa uh, is definitely going to get this one 3-0 series. I think the Pirates put up a good fight, but it's not going to be good enough. Rays with the sweep this week. On the other side, which is more surprising? The Yankees mm-hmm. being 15-15 and 15 and eight and a half back? Or the Cardinals being nine no. games under Ooh. 500 and 10 games back of the division. Oh. So I actually, I was oh, actually man. thinking about that, Joe, because I was, I was, I was considering posting uh, my my top five surprising starts of the year as far in terms of like the worst mm-hmm. teams. And I actually think the Cardinals is a more surprising start just because the Yankees play in the AL East. And I don't know if any of us pegged the Yankees to be AL division winners this year. I certainly went into the season thinking the Blue Jays were the better team, but I don't think anybody thought there was another team outside the Cardinals that would be leading that NL Central division. And yet they are pitiful right now. So I'm going to go Cardinals, but I'm going to even say there's a more disappointing team than the two of those teams, the Seattle Mariners. The Mariners are rough. The Mariners are Mariners in rough can't shape, hit right and now. I don't understand um, it because they have all the talent in the world, and yet they can't put it together this year. Yeah, yeah. Corey, Eight, you want we're losing? Yeah, I am at eight and twenty-one for the White Sox too. I mean, the White Sox have a lot of talent <laughs> on that. Team. I never liked the White Sox. I'm not I mean, giving you that listen, one. I, I didn't think the White Sox were going to be World Series champions. Don't get me wrong. I didn't think they were going to have a winning percentage of two seventy-six. I mean, they are dreadful right now. They're they're in the class of the. A's at the moment, so uh, but I think that team's a disaster. Oh. That organization is a disaster. Yeah, they're gonna break it all down at the deadline. If you want to improve your team, that's the place to go. Go pillage the White Sox because everybody's gonna be for sale. Call the White Sox. You want a little uh, offensive talent? There's a lot to pluck, and you got some yep. veterans too. A, a guy like Lynn. Listen, Lynn's not having a good year. That's not a bad guy if you want to give up a mid low end prospect and try to put in the back end of your rotation for a veteran. So. Call the White Sox. Or if, you want, yeah. or if you want a center fielder that has all the potential in the world and can't even hustle out a, a one three, uh, you can pick up Luis Robert Jr. as well. What a disappointment yep. uh, the White yeah. Sox have been. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll touch more about it, but I, I don't want to talk about other baseball teams because we're not allowed to. So we're going to keep it moving um, and, and follow us on socials. And Joe, I'm sorry. Yeah, Joe, what's the best way to do that? Uh, you can follow Empire State of Baseball on Instagram. At ESB Podcast, you can follow Corey nope. at G. Whoops, uh, you can Corey on Instagram is at Corey Favs, myself at JR Pugs, uh, Rich at Rich Shea Rivera, and Tom at T Waspel. More, more uh, importantly, you can follow us at Empire State of Baseball because you can follow yeah. us at ESB Podcast on on Twitter. Uh, so you can follow us on Twitter. At ESB Podcast, Corey at G Gory. See, Corey's the one messing up the thing because he got two different. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Corey's Twitter. fault. Yeah. Um, at G- myself at JR Pugs, Rich at Rich Shea Rivera, and Tom at T Waspel on Twitter. Uh, follow us, engage with us, uh, see all of our latest conversations on those apps. And the only thing more annoying than Corey Faz having two separate social media handles <laughs> is uh, the rainouts from this past oh. weekend. Uh, the Queen's Gambit. Let's bring it to the table. I know last year, I think it was around episode three in 2022. Mm-hmm. Go to YouTube for that one, where we discuss the use of domes and retractable roofs across baseball. And uh, I think we're all three of us. Uh, we had a we pretty, had a pretty adamant stance of how we felt about the use of of, of that uh, installation. Where uh, Corey and I and Tom were more of hey, like if baseball teams need it and they're in areas where the climate is mainly rain for this time of year, they should have one. And Joe, you felt the uh, the other side of it. Mm-hmm. Baseball should be an open door sport. And there should be no retractable roofs. Do you still feel the same way after this weekend, Joe? I, I never thought there should be no. I mean, there's extreme climates, you know, out in Arizona in the middle of the summer. And Seattle, it rains constantly. Florida, there's a thunderstorm every two minutes. So, like, there's there's climates in this country that need it. I think one stadium that needs it that de- doesn't have it is Minnesota. I mean, you get snow there. Yep. Um, you could argue some place like Colorado probably could have it as well. But as far as like New York is concerned and Boston and those things, those those cities are 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 temp, are the most moderate climate cities on earth. 
I mean, those are on a consistent basis, you know, they, they those stadiums don't need roofs on them. Listen, we had a terrible, terrible weather weekend. There is no doubt about it. It was a bad from the beginning. They squeezed half a game in uh, uh, to start the weekend. And then all of a sudden we've got two rain outs in a row. And then we got a double header. Um, and now we're in Detroit and we got rain out in Detroit. So um, it's it's been a rough weather weekend here in the Northeast. I know why everybody's thinking it. But listen, at the end of the day, this affects maybe five or six games a year when it's all said and done. So I, I don't think this is a big issue. I know fans are upset because they want to watch the games, but um, I still think uh, I I still think baseball is an outdoor sport, and for the most part, it should be remain outdoors. Yeah, I, I think we, we, the only problem I have with baseball, and it comes to roofs versus retractable roofs versus domes, open air, whatever you want to call it. Baseball is the only sport where you have to continuously monitor the weather to make sure if I'm going to buy tickets to this game, am I actually going to be going to the game? Baseball is the only sport where you have to debate, am I making this two-hour drive to a stadium with the chance of the game not even taking place? Am I going to take a day off of work on opening day knowing that the game might get canceled two or three hours before, and now I can't get the day off tomorrow. I mean, I saw stories this year uh, on Twitter with opening day where people with the rain out, it was a Thursday game. They made it up on Friday. But what happens? People take off the Thursday. They make plans. They build whole schedules around it, and now all of a sudden you can't go. It's the only sport where you have to worry about the weather. The only time you'll see another sport – possibly have a weather delay or a postponement is a catastrophic event we're talking a massive blizzard we're talking a hurricane extreme conditions uh but baseball you get a weekend like we had here in new york the friday game was rushed it shouldn't have even been started the only reason they started that game was because the pitch clock makes it quicker and they wanted to rush the game in ahead of a terrible weekend saturday rained out sunday rained out it was an absolute waste of baseball Tuesday, rain out. They're going to do a doubleheader tomorrow. Tomorrow might actually be worse weather in Detroit. I don't know why they're planning a doubleheader tomorrow. There's a chance both games are going to be postponed tomorrow. So uh, I think when it comes to baseball, I agree with Joe in the sense that the climate can play a factor. You're in San Diego, Petco Park. Yeah, there's no reason to have a dome. You're in L.A. Yeah, there's no reason to have a dome. Uh, Arizona, obviously you do. You're not going to play in 120 degree weather. Detroit and Minnesota, why these stadiums are not being built with a roof? De Minnesota, especially, you just came from a dome. And you play in one of the worst environments right off the Great Lakes where it's May. We've seen blizzards in April and May in Minnesota. And you don't have a dome on that stadium? I mean, come on. It it's very frustrating. I think at least 50% of the stadiums in baseball should have a dome because of the, uh, the environment they're in. Now, the problem with it is, you're not going to retrofit one. It, it's not cost effective by any means. It's absurd. I know Heyman came out with the article over the weekend. Oh, Cohen's looking into it. No, he's not. That was an old argument that was brought up last year that, yeah, Cohen looked into it at one point in time, and he shot it down a year or two or three ago when he bought the team. He's not looking into it now. Heyman's just trying to get interactions on his, uh, on his Twitter articles there. He's not looking into it. It's not cost effective. If you're building a new stage, Stadium, completely different story. I think you seriously have to consider it because then you could take advantage of the stadium in other times of the year. It's not going to be useless in November through March, uh, but you're not going to retrofit it. So ignore Heyman. But going forward, look into it, please. If you're in the north, I, you have to look into it. I think I read that same article, Corey. They said that if they retrofit it, it would be upwards to $800 million of a project to Correct. put in place. Whereas back in the day when the Wilpons had the chance to make uh, City Field a retractable roof stadium, it would have just been maybe somewhere in the range of 100 to 125 Correct. million to add it on, which is, in, well, I guess, inflation wise, is, is a bargain by comparison. But it, it, it's wild. I mean, that these new stadiums were in place here in the Northeast, and there was uh, minimal to no thought that maybe a roof should be over the stadium. 
Minnesota and Detroit, absolutely ridiculous, especially Minnesota since they're the newer stadium. Detroit, I'm sure they're probably going to be due for a new ballpark at some point. I mean, they've been through a couple now, but uh, uh, Comerica is, is, is trash from what I've seen on television. Uh, so they're definitely going to be due for a new stadium in the next uh, 10 or so years, and uh, they need to get a retractable roof on that ballpark. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm more on the on the fence here with uh, with Corey. I, I hate the inconvenience of having to make plans around games that get canceled, and you don't know what the deal is. Um, I'm sure owners don't care, honestly. They're more looking at the, is there much more dollar potential if we put in a retractable roof on a stadium uh, than not using it for four months out of the year or five months out of the year. Uh, I always looked at, hey, maybe they could potentially do more winter events at Yankee Stadium and City Field if you have a more retractable roof. You could see Billy Joel in December uh, perform at City Field, but it, it might not be worth it at the end of the day if, if the roofs do cost that much. Uh, you can't retrofit, but in the future, if the New York Yankees and Mets get ballparks within the next 20 to 5, 30 years, they should be getting uh, retractable roofs. No, nah, they're not. They're not replacing those stadiums. I, I again, it. I when you break it down, and I, I, I had the statistics last year of of how many teams get rained out. It's really a small amount. And when you talk home games, I mean, you, you gotta get rain outs when you go on the road. But um, there was, I think, a study done from twenty oh five to twenty fifteen. That the Red Sox in that decade led it with the most rainouts, and they only had 31. They averaged three a year. Uh, that that's it's not significant enough uh, for me. Listen, it's part of baseball. I think double headers are fun. To be honest with you, I think we should bring back normalized double headers once a month. But that's just me, um, you know. And and the other thing is we. The baseball plays so many more games than any other sports. First of all, the only other sport that really has to worry about the weather is football. They only play yeah. once a week, and they're playing in the winter months when thunderstorms, which are the only thing that really cancels football games, thunderstorms are the only thing, or a six-foot blizzard like we had in Buffalo. Um, thunderstorms are the only thing that are going to cancel a football game, so. Anyway, uh, let's talk Mets. Let's talk Mets for a second. Mets did play the Braves uh, over the scattered few days. They did lose the series two games to one, but they had a nice uh, win in last night's double uh, second game of the doubleheader. Uh, Joe Corey, uh, I saw with Corey here. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, of the Mets series against the Braves here? What, the, the problem with the Mets series with the Braves was it was hard to kind of build any momentum with all of the schedule issue. Peterson actually mm. looked good for the first four innings, uh, hit a wall in the fifth, and then, of course, the game gets called at that point, official game after the Mets didn't score. Uh, you didn't see them the rest of the week. And then you get a doubleheader. Uh, I will give the Mets offense a lot of credit in the loss in game one on Monday because they made a game out of it. I mean, the pitching, you it was a no contest early being down. 5-1 off the rip. Uh, you know, Reyes making his uh, big league debut in a starting pitching role, uh, and, and he got absolutely shelled. I don't expect to see that again. But I give the offense credit because against Strider, I mean, that's an NL Cy Young candidate right there, and they made him look uncomfortable all day. So a lot of credit to the Mets for making a game out of it. And game two, another situation. McGill was doing good. Unfortunately, he gave up. Uh, that big double in, like I think it was the fifth inning or the sixth inning, uh, to make it 3-2. And again, the Mets offense answered right back. Uh, right now, yeah, the Braves are the better team at the moment. But the Mets are right there. It's three games. Three games is mm -hmm. nothing. I'm not worried about the Mets. Actually, I'm feeling very encouraged about the Mets going forward now into this week because you're getting your top guys back. Scherzer suspension is up. He's coming back this week. Verlander's making his debut this week. We're not going to be in those situations, knock on wood, where we're relying on guys like Reyes to pitch uh, and start a game against the best team in the National League, in my opinion, the Braves. Uh, you're not going to have to rely on those as long as those guys stay healthy. And look at the young kids. Beatty right now, red hot. The guy killed it in spring. He should have been in the majors. I don't accept any argument anyone makes. People on Twitter saying, oh, they, they didn't follow the developmental things. Oh, they have a developmental guide mark. I don't care what your uh, benchmark yeah. was. He should have started the year in the majors. He was red hot yep. in AAA. He's red hot in MLB. And Alvarez, he's finally getting more regular playing time. Alvarez, they call him up. He's starting one game a week. He's your top prospect, top prospect in baseball, one game a week. Finally, you're playing him, what seems to be three out of five, and he's getting more consistent at bats, and he's actually hitting better. Uh, so I'm very happy with the kids. Vientos isn't far off. He's going to be up here 
probably in the next month or two, Vientos will be up. Uh, Mauricio, I think he's a little more time. I'm not going to rush him, but I do think he makes his debut some point this year. So I'm actually really excited right now for the Mets. Uh, it, I think their offense is finally starting to wake up. That baby pop at the end of the order. Vogelbach's also looked a little better lately. He struggled big time. Uh, so right now, I'm feeling all right. I am not worried about the New York Metropolitans right now. They're still yeah, mishandling I, of Beatty and Alvarez. Oh, sorry, uh, Joe, but the uh, the mishandling of of, uh, of Beatty and Alvarez from the beginning just was mind-boggling to me, especially yeah. when you didn't have a a concrete third baseman catcher situation. You had guys that can probably flex into the bench role. You didn't have former All-Stars. I, uh, Escar was a former All-Star, but you didn't have – Guys who should be uh, threatening to be an all-star this year. Like, Beatty and Alvarez should have been up from the very beginning and used properly. Joe? Yeah, listen, I, I the Alvarez thing, I'm not going to go crazy about. He is 20, 21 years old. So I don't I don't have a problem with him starting in the minors. I agree. Beatty probably should have been up. Um, if you haven't uh, If you haven't looked at it and you have a subscription to The Athletic, uh, they had a good article about Buck Showalter and and kind of his circle of trust and what it's like to be a player, especially a rookie coming up. They interviewed Zach Britton, Manny Machado, all sorts of them. So there's a there gives you kind of an insight into Buck's expectation for rookies when they come in, which might explain why these guys didn't play right away. Buck has a methodology for it. It's worked in the past. I'm going to trust that Buck knows what he's doing, and I think he always has. That being said, listen, this series, obviously hard to kind of get a feel for with the interruptions. That doubleheader started off the wrong on the wrong foot. Mets go into a bullpen game basically out of necessity because with the rainouts, Scherzer's suspension got delayed two more games because he would have pitched Monday – but the Mets didn't meet their 10-game requirement to get Scherzer back. They went with a bullpen game instead of having McGill and uh, and another starter be there because they needed him for the rest of the week. Little did they know they were going to have another rainout today. But uh, they would have needed a spot start if they'd started two of their starters on Monday. So they've now gotten to the point where they've set up their rotation for the week. Scherzer's back. Verlander's back. All of a sudden, the Mets are looking like a complete team, minus Nav uh, uh, Navarro, uh, Navarez, uh, you know, who's hurt. But the Mets are looking like a complete team. Beatty's yeah. ripping the cover off the ball. You love to see it. He's going to be the third baseman going forward seven out of eight days or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think the Mets are in a fine position here. If you told me on, on March 15th, that we'd be three games out of the division and Verlander, Edwin Diaz, and Jose Quintana haven't thrown a pitch in the big leagues, I'd be like, you know what? That's probably pretty good. And then and Scherzer missed three starts this year. So if you told me all that was going to happen, we'd still be within three games of the Braves for the division. You're going to take that and run. Correct. So I, I think the Mets are going to be fine here. I think I would like to see the lineup reordered a little bit as Beatty gets more acclimated. I think Beatty has that potential to be a six or a five hitter in this lineup. I'd like to see probably my ideal situation. I'd like to see Nimmo, Lindor, McNeil bat in three, Alonzo four, Marte five, Beatty six. That's what I would like to see. I don't want to see Beatty bat in eighth or ninth anymore. Yep, I, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I, you brought up Buck and a great point with Buck. I personally didn't read the article, but you do notice that he has a lot of trust and faith with his players. And I would, if I was a player, I would love to play with Buck. And that brings me to another point here. Mets Twitter has to chill yeah. with Come the on, guys. Buck nonsense right now buck right now i trust buck he's the best manager we've had in the last 15 years outside of maybe terry collins i like terry collins too but buck is a great baseball mind the team absolutely loves him i love watching all his press conferences the players love him the hate on buck has to stop. Do I agree with every single thing he does? No, I don't, but no one's perfect. I mean, who would you rather managing? Aaron Boone? I mean, look look at the rants right now against Aaron Boone. Totally warranted. Who do you want? Mickey Callaway. Uh, Mickey Callaway. I know. We, want, want, we want to go back to Galloway. Come Mickey on, Jackson guys. Callaway. Mickey Callaway was he was worried about not dry humping his relievers because oh. he was too busy dry humping the office staff. 
unbelievable with Mickey Calloway. Uh, at least Buck gives you some life. I love Buck. Mets Twitter has to chill just a little bit. We're going to be fine, Mets. Don't worry. We're going to be fine. And Tim well, there goes our Tim team rating this episode. Article, we'll, we'll link to it. Uh, we'll put it in the chat to link to it. But Tim Britton had the article with Buck, and, and it's great because he talks to former players that used to play for the Orioles, and and they, uh, they, they give a nice uh, rundown on what it's like, what these players go through, and what Buck does. Buck goes across the bench. He goes down the bench and quizzes players at what – uh, uh, what what the situation is? They ask him. He tells them not to look at the scoreboard. Tell me what the score and the count of the game is. He, he that's that's the kind of player he is. So if you if you're a rookie and you're not prepared for that, I can see how he can make you earn it over a couple week period. So I you know something like that could have happened with Beatty now first. Either way, they're going they're playing now. They're killing it. There goes our, uh, our our good for kids uh, rating on YouTube. Uh, there, Corey, thanks for that. Appreciate nope. it. Mickey uh, Callaway but- legitimately referenced that in a lot of post game things about not wanting to dry home relievers in the sense that you're pulling them up, putting them down, putting them. Yeah, up. Yeah, but like, then you would the then you brought it to the office staff. I but mean, that's we- what happened. That's why. He, <laughs> <laughs> that's why he got fired from the H. <laughs> well. <laughs> To transition from our E for Everyone rating that we just lost on YouTube, uh, what's the best way to subscribe to us on YouTube? Corey. Corey. (laughs) You did the damage. You got to live with it now. The best way to follow us on YouTube. Well, first get the YouTube app, right? Download YouTube. Get it on your phone. Uh, But YouTube, listen, YouTube's great. You have to download it because we have all the full episodes on YouTube. We also have our shorts. So if you enjoy our Instagram reels, you can find those as well on YouTube. So go ahead. Download at Empire State of Baseball. Like, share, and subscribe. That's the best way to watch the full videos of us, uh, not just once a week. Or gave you the core VP. So that's the ultimate core VP right there. <laughs> All righty. We're going to finish things up soon. Uh, we're going to get this thing uh, going with Guess the Graph. And uh, obviously Tom's uh, chilling on a gondola somewhere in Italy, uh, having his just success as uh, <laughs> Al Steinbrenner sign an Aaron Judge. But I'm going to step in for Tom today. So I'm going to sacrifice my point for the better of the show for Guess the Graph, the current standings at the bottom of the ticker. And here is our signed baseball. What well, my signed baseball right here? Mm. Raul Baez. Right. Oh, it's a great guess, but that's not it. Mm. Mm. That's not it. But yeah, it's a, it's it's an R player. It's definitely an R. Um, this guy, this guy, uh, former Yankee. <laughs> For, that narrows it down, Rich. Yeah, I, I just wanted to just gauge you guys here and see if any. I mean, it's an R, and he's a former Yankee. I think there's a pretty good uh, starting hints there. Ricky Lede. Not Ricky Lede. Um, I'm actually looking at the 2010s and not the early Ooh, 2000s. Okay. All right, so a little player. more recent. Okay. So very, very contemporary player, and it's a player that's no longer in the game. Hmm. And no. by the way, uh, for those of you guessing on Twitch, we're going to keep separate Twitch standings as well. And by year end, whoever has the best, uh, most points out of Twitch uh, will uh, will get a nice prize by year end. Joe, you said Raul Abanez, right? Yeah, I said Abanez. Good guess. good guess. Similar. So far, no correct answers in the chat. I will say that. Uh, 2010s. 2010s Yankee with an R. Uh trying to think of uh let's see how i can narrow this down here which, without uh, trying to give of, it away. which side of the ball was it offense this player? oh yeah this is this is an offensive player offensive player okay offensive player he's a, uh, a four-time all-time Mendoza. four not time Mendoza. Time Mendoza. Time again we're, we're we're sticking to 2010s here um four-time all-star four-time. Not not a Hall of Famer. Had a good career. Not a Hall of Famer. Uh, great guess in the chat here. Uh, for reference, Randy Johnson was guessed. That is incorrect from Core Ryan. And uh, Alana C827, wonder who that is. Uh, Robinson Cano, also a good guess, but not Robbie Cano. Actually, do have Robbie Cano's signature, but nonetheless... But actually, now that Robinson Cano is mentioned, this is a former teammate of Robinson Cano. 
Mm. Mm. Between 2011 and 2012. Anybody. Somebody. I don't think Rafael Fercal was a Yankee at any point in time. No, right? not Rafael Fercal. <laughs> Although it does look like Fercal's signature. Right? I, I was about um, to say, yeah, it looks a little Fercalish there, but uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, boy. Do I get the point here if none of you guys can get it? You would possibly get You this would point. theoretically get the point. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, this is no, this is no, this is no slum. This is a, this is yeah, a four-time sure. all-star. If I, if I, if I say position, it's gonna be a dead giveaway. So I don't want to go there. Rafael Soriano, not Rafael Soriano. Uh, I love Soriano when he was a Yankee. He was actually one of the last good relievers the Yankees had. That's not named Mariano Rivera, uh, but not Soriano. Wow. Chat's yeah. dead too. We got him. I think you it's might a, have that's this a one. weird signature. Uh it's uh all right. I'm giving you guys yeah. one last guess. Okay. Or or you're tapping out. Uh one last guess. Uh, Mikey Pars, um, it's not Ruben Sierra. But good guess, not Ruben Sierra. Still Ruben 2010. Sierra. I might have to tap. Joe? He four, he's a four-time All-Star? Four-time All-Star. I can't Nothing. even. All right, screw you guys. I'm taking the point. The correct answer. Oh, by the way, <laughs> my, my position was catcher. Mm. Dodger, Yankee, Pirate, Blue oh, Jay. Oh, Martin. Dodger. It is Russell oh. Martin. No point show, though. It is Russell Martin. Russell Martin was oh, the I uh, player we're looking uh, for. You said catcher. I, I knew. Oh. I forgot yeah. he was. I was trying to think, too. I was like, who was right there I, after Prasad? I, I wasn't going to try to bump it up. I wasn't trying to Sterling Hitchcock, you guys. I went with a, a legit player, legit and you guys player. were wrong. It's oh, Russell one. He's one of those Martin. guys that. I just forget, like That's... Ichiro too. A lot of people forget Ichiro was a Yankee. I I completely forget Russell Martin was a Yankee. I, I no one got it in the chat. Nobody got it on the show. I get the point. Yay me! Let's wrap this thing up with fan submitted questions. We promise to get some FSQs in. It's a segment that's brand new to Empire State of Baseball. So whether you're coming in from Twitch or YouTube, even Instagram, Twitter, if you're using the hashtag FSQ, we will answer your question on tonight's show. And we got a good one here, and and pretty much we're gonna expand on this because uh, our buddy Core Ryan, who is the uh, the master trivia man, he is Core's curriculum himself. Uh, asked the question, uh, <laughs> "What the hell do you guys think of this list by Dan Plesac?" So Ooh. Dan Plesac listed his top twenty five starting pitcher list, and obviously we're not gonna break down one through twenty five here. But, you know, you look at this list and we're kind of thinking that he's only talking about the first month and, and couple days of the season because we're talking like right now who are you dependent on. I'm not I'm not listing Justin Steele in my top 25. <laughs> and he's not at number nine. Uh, so quick thoughts on this list here, guys. Yeah, no, it's pretty I, good. It's I, I don't know what Dan Sm it, it must be like a current power rank. It's, I mean, Alcantara is not on there. Um, I don't, I don't see Burns on. The, I, I mean, this is a, yeah, this is a rough one. I, think, I mean, there's a different, the, the, there's a difference between a good month and and you know sustained success. Uh, to not even have a former Cy Young Award winner from last year on your top twenty-five. I know oh, he's had a couple of rough starts, but geez. Yeah, I, I think Dan Plesac uh, realized about fifteen minutes before the segment that he had to get this list in, and he just did a quick filter on the uh, top um, ERAs. Co yeah. Correct. Yep. So, uh, but yeah, how do you not have last year's Cy Young? I, there's so many players. I mean, Alcantara, granted, not having the best of seasons to start. I'm still gonna take him over most of this list. Corbin Burns. I, I, I mean, yeah, Game Seven of a World Series. I'm pumped. I got Justin Steele coming out. Uh, I mean, yeah, no, it, I I dislike this list. Uh, it's purely a filter over who's hot now, and that's fine. But rephrase it for who has the best numbers right now, but who, not who is the top pitcher in baseball right now. 
Uh, yeah, I, these these lists are very uh, subjective to say the least. I mean, we we had our own uh, we dove into that that pool a little bit uh, about a month or so ago with our top ten list of uh, position to position. But I don't even think we'd get so far extreme where we're only considering the first month of the year. So we Miley's in this list. Uh, I mean, it, it's you say Kikuchi. Like, uh, like, come on, Dan. Yeah, I, 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 I we just started off my life here, and we're excited oh. about the year ahead. But Tyler Wells at number 24. Some of these guys are free agents in our fantasy league, for God's sake. Like, yep. this is just terrible. Oh, what are you doing? Man. I like Plesak, but what are you doing, man? All right. Next question here. And this is coming in from Greg Kendari, uh, who asked this on Twitter. If you could meet any player that ever donned the pinstripes or the blue and orange and not necessarily the best player, who would you pick and why? If I'm going to go with the Mets, and it's a it's a recent player too, but I just love everything about him. I would love to hang out at a barbecue, have a couple of beers, and play some backyard <laughs> beer games with Bartolo Colon. I just oh, think yes. the guy is awesome. I'm taking Bartolo Colon. If you asked me as a kid, I probably would have said Cliff Floyd. I loved Cliff Floyd uh, when he played with the Mets uh, back when I was in like middle school. Uh, love Cliff Floyd, but I'm going Bartolo Colon, man. Let, let me have a beer and chill. Perfect guy to have at your barbecue, Bartolo Colon. I thought you were going to say you want to go hog hunting with Cespedes. Oh, <laughs> that would be something, too. Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I've always loved David uh, Wright. Um, you know, might might still get a chance to meet him one day. Um I that's that's a good question. I I'll have to think about. It. I'll defer to you, Rich, on this, and then I'll think about it some more. I'm not going to be boring and answer Mariano Rivera. And everybody knows Mariano is my all-time favorite player. I think that'd be just too lazy to answer that question. I don't know. I I've already met and talked to a couple of cool people that donned the pinstripes. Uh, even on this very show in Homer Bush, uh, Sparky Lyle with the Somerset Patriots, who's an ambassador over there. He's always awesome to talk about and hearing some of his stories that happened in the Yankees bullpen in the seventies are just like the wildest things. Um, uh, maybe along the lines of Corey of a Yankee that I would love to just like hang out with and have a great time with. I'm going David Wells. I'm going Ooh, David okay. Wells, man. Boomer. Boomer was nuts back in the day. Big beer drinker. He was like one of the craziest personalities in the Yankees dugout. I'm get, give me David Wells. Give me that '90s, 2000s David Wells. I think that'd be a fun personality to be around. Yeah, you fun. know, I I, it's, I thought of a good one, and he's it, it's kind of a, a a household name, and everybody would say it. And there's tons of written about him, but he was both a Yankee and a Met. How about Yogi Berra? I mean, oh. you talk about a fascinating guy that you probably. That guy would probably talk your ear off for hours mm -hmm. on end just about baseball and his thoughts on baseball. That that's somebody I like, especially like back what just after he's the manager of the Mets, you could talk to him about the Yankees, the Mets, just about anything. I I I'd go probably a, a guy like Yogi. Not a bad to see that engagement, Joe. Just watch Yogi hit you with the Yogi isms, and uh, you hit yep. him with words that struggle with the ing pronunciation. I think that'd be an awesome conversation to see play out. Uh, but we do have uh, one more question that trickled into to Instagram here uh, for our, our final FSQ, and we're back to the Yankees. Should the New York Yankees tank and sell at the deadline? It's a little extreme, I would say. Thank yeah, you for the tank. The Yankees won't. If if the Yankees tank, Steinbrenner should sell the team. It's uh, I don't see the Yankees tanking. Selling at the deadline, different story because they did it back in well, I think it was 2016, and that quickly turned mm -hmm. the team around. Uh, I'm not opposed to selling and and just blowing it up at the deadline, but you're not going to tank. I think tanking is the worst thing for every single sport, and there should be tanking penalties instead of rewards. Yeah, I, I think there's a difference between not firing uh, in a given year and, and tanking. Um, yeah. You know, clearly this team is in trouble. Uh, I, the Yankees are never going to tank. They're never going to outright sell. Uh, they don't have many pieces to sell anyway. Um, they're probably going to tread water and probably going to be within shouting distance of the wild card when Judge comes back and Stanton comes back. So the Yankees are going to try to go for it. Um, but
But, you know, if it ever gets to the point where they're five games under 500, six or seven games out of a wild card, I can see them, you know, trading off a guy like Torres and 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 maybe a guy like Rizzo or or something like that uh, and, and trying to improve the – or Severino if he gets healthy. Maybe yeah. not Rizzo, Severino if he gets healthy. Um, I can see him kind of retooling around that and trying to get some decent prospects that are major league ready. But the Yankees, that it's not in their DNA to sell. I mean – it's about it's time they've had yet. a season that's a failure like everybody else has, but but selling is is a long, long way from, from what no, the Yankees it, do. It, it's not it's not the Yankee way. They just no. don't quit and sell uh, at the deadline. They did it one season and the next year they took the Astros to limit in the in the ALCS. So you saw it work out to its almost full potential uh in terms of just selling a team and being successful the very next year. Um, the Yankees just don't do that. And, and and you mentioned Torres and Rizzo as possibilities to move. You know, when it comes to selling teams at trade deadline, you usually try to sell the guys that are coming off the books. And the Yankees really don't have that many attractive assets coming off the books that no. they can sell at the deadline. So they're going to be in that weird impasse where they will probably trade, but they'll still probably bring in pieces and maybe look towards 2024 with some moves. Maybe like I, I make it to akin to like the Marcus Stroman trade the Mets had years ago yeah. where it wasn't for that season. It was for the next season or two. So we'll see what happens though. It's obviously too early to tell and to uh, say that they're going to tank and sell a team is definitely an extreme question at that. Uh, but we'll, we'll address that when we get towards the other uh, trade deadline. All righty. Um, I think that's going to be it there for um, FSQ. So thank you guys for submitting your questions. Looking forward to doing that in the future. We'll be back here on a Monday, finally. Uh, that's actually episode number 45. We'll be back. We're not 44. Today's 44. Uh, Monday, May 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll see you guys for then. Uh, but we'll, we'll take it around the room, starting with Corey. Uh, any final words of wisdom? Uh, only words of wisdom I got right now is just everybody just relax. Just relax. <laughs> it's, it's, it's May 2nd. If we're I at am Memorial Day. And we're still panicking. There's legit reason to panic. But it's May 2nd. Let's relax. And uh, also, let's go Knicks. Uh, 61-64 right now in the third. Uh, so let's go Bockers. We're 67-61, but let's go Bockers. Yeah, uh, what Corey said, everybody's got to calm down. Uh, Mets got a lot to look forward to this week. Scherzer's back. Verlander's going to pitch for the first time in a Mets uniform. Um, you know, the kids are killing it. So uh, we're – going to face the Rockies and the Tigers. That's reason to hope right there. Uh, you know, we could have a very different conversation next Monday on, on where the Mets stand. So, um, you know, let's just keep an eye on that. And I'm excited for the second round of the hockey playoffs with uh, the Devils. So. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are, Joe. Uh, Yankees just took the lead on the Guardians 3-2 as Willie Calhoun just went deep. So hopefully the Yankees can uh, – Hopefully win a game. We'll see what happens. We'll have more to say on the Yankees come next Monday and the New York Mets as always. Uh, but until then, we'll see you here next Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern time, right here on Twitch. Take care.